This is important stuff. This isn't like, well, let's get pride about our lives because, you know, I'll be a nicer person and people will like me more. No, this is a matter of where you're going to spend your eternal destiny, destination. Your, your eternal, everlasting life is going to be determined by did you receive the grace of God and salvation or did you reject it because of your pride? That's how important this subject is. Everybody, welcome to the Lift It Up podcast. My name is Corey O'Neill. I'm on staff here at New Beginnings. And I'm here with our lead pastor, Joe Source. And the Lift It Up podcast is a place where we add value to your life from the Word of God. This is a place where we dig deep into the scriptures because we believe that the scriptures are the best place to start with when we want to add value to your lives. And um, if you've been tuning in with us, if you've been listening, uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the feedback. Or if this is your first time watching or listening, welcome. We pray that you're going to be blessed by the word. You're going to be blessed by the message uh, that we're going to be getting into today. So we're talking about getting more of God's grace. And, you know, just recently I was talking to somebody in our church who's a police officer, and he was getting a lot more domestic abuse calls during the year 2020 when everything was shut down and pe people were home more either because uh, they lost their jobs or because they were working at home and he was getting um all the all these calls for domestic abuse uh like it, it just those kinds of cases just really shot up during the year 2020. Well, just think about that you've got a couple who may not be getting along yeah. that great as it is but they're only seeing each other you know, a limited amount of time a day because both going off to work. Now, both of them are home. Then on top of that, add to the equation, if you've got one or two kids home from school, you're trying to homeschool them, plus trying to get along with each other, plus trying to do your jobs. And so the result has been what you're talking about here, just yeah. a, a, an uptick in just domestic abuse phone calls. Yeah, it's crazy. It really, it, really, it really blew my mind when I heard that, that just people being around each other more uh, caused this strife. And the reason why we're bringing that up uh, for the topic of getting more of God's grace has to do with the scripture in Proverbs. And it's in Proverbs 13, 20. All right, we're talking about getting more of God's grace. So how are we going to do that? Well, first we need to know what we're doing wrong. Proverbs 13, 10. By pride comes nothing but strife. But with the well-advised is wisdom. The key word is strife. Strife. You said before the reason those domestic abuse calls were coming in, reports were coming in, cases to deal with, was because of strife. Yeah. And as the scriptures point out, um, many times, if not most of the time, the thing that causes strife in a home would be pride. Yeah. Would be that root sin there. Yeah. So, so it's definitely something that... Um, kind of, I would imagine, snuck up on our society, not yeah. expecting that. Because, again, when people are busy, you're not around each other. And let's face it, if you've got one person in the household who's typically operating in pride, yeah. there's going to be strife. Yeah. Now, do, do, do I need to be somebody who, who is violent against somebody else in order to, to qualify as someone who is in pride? Violence? No, right? Yeah. This, because this can, can, or can this apply to anybody? Oh, I think it can apply to anyone. Yeah. Sure. I and mean, let's face it, let's be completely transparent here. There's not one person listening to this or watching this or neither one of us here that don't deal or struggle with yeah. some type, some form of pride. And then I would imagine it could be a higher level at some points in life and different seasons of life and maybe not so much at other, other times of life. But pride is something that is completely 100% uh, built into our, you know, I hate to say it, DNA. Yeah. Um, because of sin, because of sin coming into the world. Let's face it, the first sin recorded uh, was not the sin in the Garden of Eden. The first sin reported is when Lucifer turned yeah. on God the Father. Yeah, we don't and, think about that a lot. Right, through pride, you know, yeah. I will be like the Most High. I will, I will, I will, I will. Everything's yeah. self-centered. And so that we inherited that, and you know that, and yeah. I, I'm sure most of our people realize that. We inherited that. So it's not something to say, wow, I didn't think I was capable of it. Even when even when we don't think we're capable of it, there's probably some of it there. Yeah. So, so there, there's a connection between pride and God's grace. Um, but uh, and I want to talk about that. But first, I want to ask, 
Uh, Because this could be kind of a vague term, God's grace. So what exactly is that? God's grace, I think the best way we could define it, because this is a popular topic right now. It's all over the place. Everybody's talking about grace, grace, grace. But most of the time when people are talking about grace, they're talking about a Band-Aid that's available to us when we sin. Yeah. But if you really study the Scriptures and really get away from man's tradition, traditional view of the Word of God, traditional view of the subject of grace. You find out that grace is provided for us so we don't fall, so we don't f- go for the temptation, so we yeah. don't fall for anything that comes along. It's an empowerment yeah. to allow us to do the things that would naturally be impossible for us to do. That's To me, I think that's the best definition, working definition of grace. It's me reaching out to God by faith, taking hold of His grace, accessing His faith, faith, uh, excuse me, grace, getting his grace to work in my life. And in order to do that, pride is directly connected to that. Pride is directly, we're told in the scriptures, it's a definite obstacle to the grace of God working in our life. Think about it. A person who's prideful, a person who's so full of themselves, uh, you, you, you witness to them, you tell them about Jesus. Oh, well, that's good for you. I don't need that. You know, I got my act together. I'm not like you. I'm not a uh, I'm not a degenerate. I'm not a drug addict. I'm not an alcoholic. I'm not a gambler. I'm not a womanizer or whatever. So, you know, I'm living a moral life. Well, that's great because I think I shared this recently. We preached on this topic a few weeks ago on pride that, yeah, there'll be a special VIP section in hell for the people who only went there who rejected Christ, not because they were degenerate or a drug addict or a murderer or a bank robber or anything like that. So that person who's in that pride, like I'm good, I got big shoulders, I can handle life on my own. How are they going to get saved? Why? Because salvation is a matter of grace. So it, this is this is important stuff. This isn't like, well, let's get pride of our lives because, you know, I'll be a nicer person and people will like me more. No, this is a matter of where you're going to spend your eternal destiny, destination. Your, your eternal, everlasting life is going to be determined by did you receive the grace of God and salvation or did you reject it because of your pride? That's how important this subject is. And that's why I think it's a good idea for us to do this uh, using that last message a few weeks ago on pride as kind of a launching pad because you can't cover all this in one service. It's impossible to cover it in one weekend for people to realize the majority of people that are going to, well, every single person that's in hell is in hell because of pride. Think about it because they would have to bow their knee to receive Jesus Christ, which means they would have to humble themselves. To humble yourself means you qualify for the grace of God. To stay in pride means you are disqualified from the grace of God. It's that important. So now take it to more of a relatable everyday scenario. You have a person in, in, that you're in a relationship with that's in pride, okay? So they're in pride, whether they realize it or not, how are they going to possibly bring any grace into that relationship? Yeah. This is why what you read before, yeah. the end result is strife. Yeah. Pride is always going to result in strife. That's one of the ways it manifests. Yeah. You know, if, if, if you have an argument with your wife, you, have, you guys have a disagreement, right? Okay. And you're wrong, but you refuse to admit that you're wrong because you're too prideful. You're too proud to go to her and say, hey, listen, I, I'm really sorry. I was wrong. But what happens? Now you start to put a, a seed of division in that relationship. Strife. Yeah. So now, now it becomes easier for you the next time not to apologize, not to humble yourself. And so now you're adding, you're, you're opening up the floodgates of pride to come in and manifest yeah. itself. And that's where that, that scripture gets fulfilled. Yeah. You know, what, what you're talking about and in regards to this scripture, by pride comes nothing but strife. I listened to Bible teacher Andrew Romack uh, teaching uh, in depth on pride and specifically on, on this verse. And he made the point that I never really think about it. A lot of people don't really think about all of our problems in, in our relationships when there's strife is we think that it's the other person. Mm-hmm. Which is prideful right there. But it's me. Mm-hmm. It's pride. Mm-hmm. It's, some, it's, it's the strife that's going on in me that's causing the strife that's going on. But you realize even if, even if you're right... In the argument. Yeah. 
that's even worse because I think that pumps up our pride even mm-hmm. more. Like, wow, I told you so. I knew this was going to happen. This yeah. is exactly what I said was going to happen, what the outcome was going to be. Yeah. Or I told you this was the way it was and you didn't believe me. But So now what do we do? We start pumping ourselves up. Um, I remember years ago, this was a long time ago, <laughs> early on in the ministry. Um, my wife was the one that was handling all the financial paperwork here. Every every accounting, every every bit of our financial accountability, she was having to handle everything. And so um, she came across a like an accounting service and um, she discussed it with me and I said to her, this is fine, we can do this, but I'm really concerned that we're bringing somebody else from the outside in that's going to see the confidential records of who's giving, who's supporting, all this other kind of stuff. You know, you, we do our best to try to protect everyone's uh, confidentiality and their, and their um, information. Yeah. We, we, we are obsessed to make sure that we handle sure. everything properly. And so um, I said, if you can guarantee me that this person is not going to have access to that information. Now, the person lied to her and told her, no, I don't have to see any of that stuff. It turns out none of that was true. And this woman went into all of our records, had all that information. And my wife was just so upset, so devastated. I remember I was sitting in, this is where we used to be in our old offices. I was sitting in my office and her office was right next door. It was like the Lord said, you go in there right now and you relieve her of this burden. Okay, she she is feeling terrible right now because she feels like she let you down. And I went in there, I said to her, listen, okay, this was a mistake, that's fine. Okay, but I don't want you carrying the burden of this wrong. You were tricked. You were not told the truth. And it was like something broke between yeah. us. It was, it was because, you know, uh, and it had to be the grace of God because at any other time I would have went, I told you, <laughs> you didn't listen to me. Yeah. We shouldn't have done it this way. <clears throat> now we put ourselves in danger. And the danger was minimized completely because, you know, we confronted this person and said, you give us back all these records. You are not taking any of this information. So we, we caught it. We nipped it. But my wife was carrying a tremendous burden of guilt. Yeah. Like she had really let us down. And so literally I could feel the grace of God come on me and just say, you go in there right now and relieve yeah. her of this burden. Don't let her stay with this burden on her shoulders. But that could have been a major area of strife between us. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, when we're right, it's more dangerous than when we're wrong because that fuels our pride. Yeah. So even when we're right, we still need to handle it in a humble way. That's an interesting thing to think about. See what I'm saying? I don't think, I don't think most people think about that. No, because when we're but, right. But pride is so insidious. It's so sneaky. It's so yeah. subtle. We don't even realize we're, we're operating in it. Yeah. It, but look, let's just look at, at a principle yeah. as they're taught in the Word. We understand that principles are in the Word to help us, to empower yeah. us. That, literally, the Word of God is the grace of God to us. Okay, if you remember Paul in the book of Acts, when he's saying goodbye to all those pastors in Ephesus, he says to them, I commit you unto God yeah. and unto the word of his grace, grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance, inheritance among the saints. Okay, that's a powerful concept. Okay, so the word of God is the grace of God. But don't you notice that prideful people never want to read the word of God? Hmm. Or they'll give you, or they'll tell you things like, "Oh no, I've read the Bible and there's contradictions." Here. No, you didn't, because if you read the Bible, you would realize there were no contradictions in the Word. Yeah. So a prideful person makes believe they know everything about the Bible only because of what they experienced when they were children, maybe in the church they grew up in, or this preacher said that, or that preacher said this, or or this this denomination has this viewpoint, but they never get into the Word of God for themselves. Right. There's that pride factor. I don't need this. This is just a crutch. So what happens? They're not taking advantage of the grace of God. And the grace of God is the overriding, just overwhelming theme of of the Bible. The whole reason this this exists is to make God's grace available to us. So James. Can I just add one thing? Sure, go ahead. Because you say take advantage of the grace of God. And and that's connected to his word, right? Yeah, not taking advantage of the negative sense. Not in a negative. In other words availing yourself of the principles that are already revealed to you. Yeah, because you, what you just said just made me think of Adam and Eve. They had the Word of God. Yeah. They didn't have it in a book form. But they had him right in front of them. They had him right in front of them, and he told them, do not eat of this tree, for right. in that day you will die. Right. right. Surely so, you will so die. So even the temptation, think about this. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. Because let's look at it this way. Even that temptation 
It says for the tree look good, mm -hmm. the fruit look good to eat. Yeah. You know, it was pleasing to look at. They could have tapped into the grace of God yeah. and said, no, I'm not going for that. Yeah. Because they had, they knew God. They knew him face to face. He is gracious. He yeah. is grace. They could have tapped into their relationship that they had with him. Yeah. Somehow they forgot that. And that's what enabled them to go after it. But God would have graced them. Okay. I talk about that scripture all the time in Titus chapter 2. I know we're going to get to James chapter yeah. 4 here, but you just triggered something when you said that. Titus chapter 2, I believe it starts in verse 11 or verse 14. It says, for, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, yeah. teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, to live soberly and righteously in this present age. And then it goes on to say, yeah. as we're awaiting the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Christ. grace is a person. Grace is a person, but grace is an empowerment too. Yeah. Like when a person says, you know, I've really been studying on the grace of God. Okay. Um, so then you're telling me that you're stronger now to be able to resist temptation. Um, well, no, no, I'm studying the grace of God because I know I'm a sinner and I'm going to fall. No, that's not what it says that grace is for yeah. in the scriptures. It says that it's an empowerment from God yeah. that teaches us. So if you're not learning anything about resisting sin, then you're really not in grace. You're in pride. Hmm. Okay? Teaches us to not just avoid, it says to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, worldly passions, worldly craving. Yeah. So that we could live righteously, soberly, and godly in this yeah. present age. That's for now. Grace is for now. Yeah. Grace is for now. So you know, you know what I think about? It? I think. I've been thinking about this a lot recently. A lot of people will read the Bible, um, and what they take away with is, and not that this is wrong, but there's got to be more. They'll say, oh, okay, this is a good example for me to follow. It's more than that, because the grace of God is a person. Mm -hmm. So, And that person lives in us. Yeah. The scripture, it's its not just an example. The scripture is a person. Jesus is the word made flesh, and he lives in me, and he lives in you, and he, and he lives, if, if you're watching this, and if you receive Jesus, the, way, spirit the, lives in you. the yeah. way the truth and the life is not just a theory. It's a, he's, he's he's a, a person, person, and he yeah. lives in us, yeah. and he cares about well, us. Well, that's the difference between religion and Christianity. Religion yeah. is theory. Yeah, It's um, rules and regulations. It's a way of co conducting yourself. No, Christianity is you have this person literally comes to live in you. His yeah. spirit comes to live inside of us. Imp spirit of grace mm -hmm. empowering us. Yeah. And I think to and that's why that's why I bring this up, because if I'm only seeing the word of God as just an example for me to in my own strength follow it, it, But if I don't see it as more of that, if, if I don't also see it as, OK, this isn't just pointing to the truth or Jesus isn't just pointing to the truth. He is the truth. He's not just pointing to the way. He is the way. And right. He what? lives in me. The truth lives in me. Exactly. He's empowering exactly. me. But if, if I don't see it, if I don't allow my understanding to go that far, I will operate, operate in pride and I will read the Proverbs every day and thinking, okay, I got to do this instead of the grace of God empowers me to do this. To do this. Right? Absolutely. Right. Yeah. This is power. Yeah. This is just not letters on a page. These, this is power. And that's why we need this operating in our lives. We yeah. need to be aware of what it says so that we can believe God by faith to have the grace to walk it out. Yeah. Okay. He saved us by grace, but then we also stand by grace. And that's why pride is such a deadly enemy to the believer. Mm -hmm. It's a deadly enemy to humankind, just no matter who yeah. you are, saved, unsaved. Because again, as we talked about before, if a person stays in pride, they end up in hell. If a Christian who's born again, Holy Spirit living inside them, but still entertains pride, it's deadly. Yeah, it's hell on earth. It's hell on earth. You're going yeah. to still, in some areas of life, still live like you did before you knew Christ. Yeah. And that's that's not good. Yeah. It's not good for us. It's yeah. not good for the people who are looking to us, who are looking for an example of somebody who's really walking this out, who's really living like this. So yeah. it's dangerous. So you want to go to James? Yeah, let's go to James. It's interesting. But again, I think, I believe James is one of the most practical books in the Bible. Yeah. There's really not much doctrine, I don't think, in, in, in James. It's not just, it's really not a, a letter filled with doctrine. 
Um, I think the doctrine is assumed here. Right. Yeah, it's assumed. Because he, he's writing to him. Mean, this is Jesus' yeah. brother, his yeah. half-brother. Okay. And so he's writing from the viewpoint of Judaism. Yeah. But he's writing to people assuming that they know exactly what he's already talking about. So you don't see a lot of exp explanations, uh, doctrinal explanations. Yeah. You see a lot of encouragement. You see a lot of admonition. You see a lot of advising. I yeah. think it's good for you to do this. You so, know what I just thought of? Sorry to interrupt, but that's okay. I never thought of this until now. Yeah, there's not so much doctrinal explanation in this. It's presumed, um, and it's presumed, and and I, and, I, and I say that because, for me personally, and and I don't know if you have found this. I don't know if anybody who's who's watching or listening is, um, who have been reading the scriptures for a while, who've been walking for the Lord, walking with the Lord for a while, or if you haven't been for a while, you may find yourself. Um, doing this where I can get so um, very obsessed or, or very Quota. devoted, very devoted to um, knowing the doctrine and focusing on the doctrine and forgetting how to live it out. The practical side. Forgetting the practical, forgetting, yeah. forgetting how to, how to live out yeah. my theology. Yeah, you might've heard me share this recently. I don't remember if it was on the weekend or during a midweek service. Uh, many years ago, I was doing a teaching on a midweek service and, a gentleman that was there, very intellectual individual, very smart, brilliant, brainiac, okay? He came up to you after service and said, hey, you know what? Man, the information you gave us tonight was fantastic. This was so good. You really taught me some things. He said, but one thing you didn't teach me, how do I apply this? Mm -hmm. And man, it just shot through me like, oh my gosh, he's 100% right. Information transfer without the practicality of this is how you do this just makes the information useless. Yeah. It neutralizes the whole thing. And uh, that's why I, I like the book of James because it is very practical. Now, chapter four starts out with some thoughts that he has. Yeah. But we're going to see that eventually it's going to come down to a matter of grace. Yeah. Okay? To, me, to me, this seems like these, these verses, uh, these first, um, you know, six or seven or eight verses in, in, in James four, I take it as the... The anatomy of, of a of an episode of pride, like hmm. the inner That's working, of, the inner working of pride, like what like happens, dissecting this dissecting whole thing and what, what it produces. Yeah. Well. So I think it's well. He that starts out that way in verse one. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure? That war in your members. In other words, it's all about you. It's about fulfilling your yeah. desires. Here you go. You lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. That's serious, man. You got to have pride working on steroids here to, to get you to the place where forget about just lust, but you're talking about murder. Yeah. Covet. In other words, I want I want what you have, but I can't have it, so I don't want you to have it either. Yeah. Um, and uh, the war in your members is talking about these strong desires. Yeah, you do not have. I'm, I'm now down in verse two now. You do not have because you do not ask. Wouldn't pride stop you from asking? Pride would stop me from asking. Pride would stop God. me from asking, or even asking you. How many yeah. times, like you know, the person needs help, and they desperately need help. Yeah. But they, they're, they're, I don't want you to know that I'm not able to do something, mm -hmm. so I won't ask you for help. Well, that's pride. Well, I'm yeah. not going to have. I won't have what I need. I won't have the wisdom I need. I won't know the. I won't know how the instructions that I need because I'm too prideful to yeah. come to you and say, hey, Corey, listen, I, I don't know how to do this. Can you help me with something? Do you think it's also talking about, in addition to that, do you think one could also take that as you do not have because you do not ask of God? Like, in other words, like, you're, you're not even praying to God or, or trusting in God to provide your needs? Do you think? That, uh, I believe so. I think okay. because, especially if a person has a track record yeah. of being successful on their own, they're not going to be in the habit. It's not going to be a lifestyle to ask God yeah. or anyone else. Because you know why? Because I think asking asking God will mean I have to subscribe to his method and his timing. No, only that, but I have to admit that I need him. I have to admit that, yeah, and I have to admit that I need him. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So verse 3 says, you ask and do not receive because you ask amiss. Or in other words, we could say you're asking with the wrong heart agenda, okay, that you may spend it on your own pleasures. Now he gets serious. Verse 4, adulterers and adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Well, if the world, the world system operates on pride, then when we start acting and, and constantly wishing like it was the yeah. good old days or wishing like or being jealous of somebody that's still in the world because it seems like they're succeeding and we're not. Yeah. 
or their relationship, they have better relationships than us, or wow, look at, you know, he's really got a hot wife, or this kind of, when you get involved in that kind of stuff, it's all pride based, yeah. all pride God, God considers it as like spiritual adultery. Well, that's where, yeah, yeah. exactly. So adulterers, adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Now, this is all tied into that scripture that we're going to get to in just a few seconds here. God resists the proud, yeah. but he gives grace to the humble, okay? So, uh, verse 5, do you, not, do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, je jealously. He wants all of us. He doesn't want pride to have any of us. He doesn't yeah. want us having side interests. He wants us to be completely devoted to him. He wants us to come to him in humility. He wants us to be completely dependent and sold out to him. And that's when we operate in grace. Verse 4, okay? But he gives what? Oh, verse 6, mm -hmm. you mean? Verse 6, yeah. I'm sorry, verse 6. He gives what? More grace. What are we talking about? We're talking about getting the, more of the grace of God. We're the empowerment. Empowerment. Accessing the grace of God more. Therefore, he says, and he's quoting from the Old Testament, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Okay, now it gets really practical. Okay? So now, once you're, if you're in pride and you're resisting God, you're not going to be able to do what he says in verse 7. But because we humble ourselves and he gives more grace, we're able to now practically apply verse 7 therefore submit to god resist the devil and he will flee from me and most people are doing it the opposite devil i resist you devil i resist you devil i resist you devil i rebuke you sickness i rebuke you poverty i rebuke you where's the submission part hmm. the submission is the connection to god's grace that's good I, I, in myself and without humbling myself to god Without receiving his grace, I am no match for the kingdom of darkness. Neither are you. We are no match for him. The only reason we can stand against the kingdom of darkness, the only reason we can come against the attacks of the enemy, the challenges that, that are sent our way, sickness, disease, poverty, depression, lack, uh, just mental oppression, anything like that. The only reason we have any authority over that is because of the grace of God. Yeah. By the grace of God, Jesus has given us his name to use against the kingdom of darkness. But look at the steps here. First, you do what? You submit to God. Now I'm ready to resist the devil. It goes back to that Titus chapter 2 verse I was talking about. Now I'm ready to resist the devil and he will flee. The devil does not have to flee from the person that's in pride. No. The devil only has to flee from the person that's walking in humility. Why? Because he knows humility is that connection to the grace of God and yeah. accessing and getting more of the grace of God. Yeah. It goes on to say in verse 8, I mean, there's a lot here. Draw near to God and he will, he'll draw near to you. Draw near to God. You see who has to do the drawing first? Yeah. We do. Why? Because yeah. that's an act of humility. What does it look like to draw near to God? Draw near to God is like uh, our dependence. Draw near to God is exactly what yeah. we did before we started this, before we started recording we this. We prayed. We prayed. We asked God, Father, we come to you. We're looking to you for guidance. We're submitting ourselves to you. We acknowledge you in all of our ways so that according to Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, that you can direct our path. It, you can't come to anybody without humbling yourself, and at least successfully anyway. Okay? Because yeah. so, you can talk. Uh, I'm sorry. I just thought so. Because you mentioned the word dependence. And that's the theme of, of, this, of year. this year from yeah. the beginning yeah. church dependence on God. Man, if it's been a year of dependence yeah. on God, man, I, we got this one right. Yeah. And it's like you, you can't talk about dependence on God, but, but then not think about, okay, well, what's that going to involve? Dropping pride and Absolutely. submitting. And being aware of it. Yeah. Being aware of pride. Yeah, definitely. Because in order to be dependent on God, we have to come to him humbly. Mm -hmm. Okay? So draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Well, that's connected to if you ask wrong with the wrong motives, you're not going to get anything. Yeah. You ask and you ask amiss because you want to spend it on your own pleasures, your own desires, your own cravings. Uh, he goes on to say, lament and mourn. Uh, uh, lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. You would think, wow, I thought God wants me to be happy. I thought God wants me to have a joyful life and a peaceful life. Yeah, when we get the chunk out of our lives, because yeah. look at verse 10 now. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will do what? Lift you up. He'll lift you up. 
We don't have to lift ourselves up. Yeah. I don't need to be operating in pride to be on top of things. When I humble myself, at some point in time, God's going to lift me up. Yeah. When I read that, and uh, I'll let you share what you want to share as soon sure. as I say. When I read that, I think of Joshua. Man, you talk about a, a guy, a person of character, a person of integrity. Here he is. He's content to live in Moses' shadow for most of his life. Moses is the number one. Everybody knows Moses, okay? But Joshua walked in his shadows for years, decades, okay? But then there comes a time after Moses is off the scene that God speaks to Joshua and says to him, I am today going to begin to exalt you in the eyes of Israel. Wow. That's exactly what the scripture is talking about here. Joshua humbled himself all that time. Let Moses be the big shot. Let Moses have the spotlight. Let me, he's the guy behind the scenes to do whatever Moses tell him to do. Joshua's taking yeah. care. Joshua's fighting the battles. Joshua's facing the enemies. And so that was a time of sowing and sowing and sowing and sowing. He humbled himself so that in due time, God could lift him up. That's what we need to yeah. do. I, you know, you talking about that, that makes me think about something that, that, that I've talked about before. Uh, am I willing to serve somebody else's vision. Mm-hmm. You know, when, when God puts a dream on your heart, I, I've talked about this when I've talked about your, your, your separation and your calling and your separation. And when God puts a dream on your heart, um, are you going to be so full of pride that you're going to attempt to make it happen now right. and expect that other people to serve your vision now? Um, or But, but you we, never sowed that. But you never sowed that. Because sewing requires humility. Yeah, and, and we've talked about this in, in, I forget if it was the last episode or two episodes ago when we were talking about how the kingdom operates. Mm-hmm. It, oper- it operates by faith. Um, but one of the principles in the Word of God, the very beginning, in, in the first chapter of the Bible, God introduces this principle of seeds. Yep. That seeds are going to produce yep. and the same thing. And they after their own yeah, kind. you get Absolutely. what you plant. Yep. Uh, the, the the person full of pride doesn't want to spend time. No, doesn't want somebody. to. No, no, because they think they're better than everybody else. Yeah. Oh no, maybe you, Corey, you're going to have to spend time sewing. But me, nah, I'm yeah. already prepared. I'm ready to go. And usually, those people fall flat on their faces. You know, I almost made that mistake many years ago. You know, when we first when I knew that the Lord was calling me to go to Rama to Bible school in '94. Okay, that's when it first started. '94. We got there in '95. But we took a trip out in the spring of 95, actually, to be absolutely, completely accurate. We arrived in Tulsa, Oklahoma, the week after the Oklahoma City bombing. Okay? Mm-hmm. That's how I knew exactly when it was. Okay? And we got there, and I knew that night, the first night that we got there, I knew. I had this experience during the night. I couldn't sleep. I was up. I had uh, Christian television on in the hotel room. Everybody else is asleep, and I'm there. And I'm like, Lord, I know you're calling me here. Watch this now. But I don't have two years to, to wait here. There's too many people back in New Jersey that need God, that need you, that need yeah. to hear the word. I don't have two years to, to spend here. I almost made that mistake, okay? And then God used a person that was teaching on Christian television. Here it is, like 3 o'clock in the morning, okay? Wow. And this teacher was on. Her name is Marilyn Hickey. She's a wonderful woman of God. And she was doing a teaching on a gentleman, a man called Bezalel from the Old Testament, from the book of Exodus, okay? And God said to Moses, because Moses is like the same way, like, I don't have time for this. Hmm. And, and God said to Moses, I have already prepared Bezalel, I've already prepared Joshua. Wow. And the Lord spoke to me and said, if you'll give me, like I could remember it like it was yesterday. The Lord spoke to me and said, if you'll give me these two years, I will raise up your Bezaleels, I'll raise up your Joshuas, I'll have everybody in place. Wow. And when you get back to New Jersey two years from now, you will be ready to run. And that's exactly what happened. This that's church awesome. took off from day one. But if I hadn't given those two years, if and, and trust me, it was a humbling experience. There were times when we didn't have money to live on. There were times when we were just living from from hand to mouth. But looking back now, I would have never changed it any other way. Wow. I would have never done anything different. It's a humbling experience. You have to get rid of the pride. But I was almost succumbing, if I could put it that way, to that pride. I didn't realize it was pride. I thought, yeah, I'm the man. Uh, I'm the one who, God, who God's calling to go back to New Jersey and start this church and blah, 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 blah. And they were all good intentions, but I didn't realize that I was almost giving myself over to pride. Mm. It's a sneaky thing. Yeah. 
but I would have I would have shipwrecked this ministry. Wow, there's no way we would be where we are today. Absolutely not. Thank God you listened. I, I, but you know, it's the grace of God, Corey. You yes. really can't even take credit for it. I talk about it now, looking backwards and realizing the steps and thanking yeah. God. But it's God's grace. Yeah, it's His grace. But but if you don't keep yourself humble, how is God's grace even going to work in your life? Yeah. See, because you could be humble and still make stupid mistakes. You can be humble. You can walk in humility and, and because you're not realizing, wait a second, that thought is pride. I didn't realize it was pride. I honestly was convinced. No, I don't have two years to, to spend here. You know, I got to get back there. I got to get going. Yeah. And man, it was a great life lesson to learn. You know something? Because what you just said, you didn't realize it was pride. Like you had good intentions. You want to serve God. Yeah, I didn't realize you know, it was pride. Because th that makes me think about, um, and, and I was thinking of sharing this. So... A few years ago, God put it on my heart to uh, to write a book, and I take that as start doing it now. Uh, because I remember that a lot of times when God calls us to do things, where God puts a dream on our heart, uh, it's not always for for it's that. It's not moment. for now. It's not for now. What does Habakkuk say? Habakkuk write the right. vision. Write make the vision. It, make it plain. Make it plain. Go on. Though it though, tarries, though it tarries, you'll know when the time comes and you'll yeah. be able to run with it. Yeah. So I didn't know when the time. I, I thought the time was then. Okay. So I'm spending all my time like in um, trying to come up with stuff, trying to create, trying to produce my, with, with my own strength. Um, but like the motive was there. I, re I really wanted to write something right. that was going to help people. And okay. So then, like you know, not long after, maybe a year or two or something like that, after the initial you know dream that got put in my heart. Uh, I get married, okay, and, and and I'm still trying to write this book. And you know, many of you know that you know when when you uh, live with somebody, when when you have another person in your life, a spouse, that you don't get to have your own schedule that fits your <laughs> your preference. Well, you found that out early. Yeah, I found that out pretty quick, <laughs> and I didn't learn right away either. Um, I, I, I insisted, I insisted on like, no, I am too important to do the dishes. I, you know, those are real feelings in my heart. I am too important to spend all this time cleaning and, and, you know, and, and, and all this kind of stuff. And that's why I really felt because I, I felt like, no, I need to serve God. I need to do this thing. Okay. And, and like, see, see, like at the point I'm only Christian for a few years, uh, like, I think I'm C.S. Lewis and I think I, <laughs> so uh, and I don't know, and I guess it was maybe 2020 or so when, when I, I really, God made it clear to me because he does give grace. Yes. I, I think he gives the more grace when, when he sees that, that you're willing to, but like, if he sees that you have no intention of, of, of repenting, yourself. of repent, of humbling yourself, it, like, then I, I think he will set himself against you. If he sees that there's absolutely no tension in your heart there's a perfect example in the old testament of that we were going to talk about yeah but i just and want to finish real quick yeah so please. just because what i didn't realize is that i don't really know as much about the bible as i thought i did okay and that was the kind of book that i got yeah but you had some amazing uh, i remember sitting down and discussing some stuff with you. you had amazing principles you had amazing concepts sure. there uh you were preparing for that book and i believe someday you're going to write that sure and later down the road and you know what because I didn't know. Okay, God wanted me to attend New Beginnings Bible School. Okay, and so now I, I think about the kind of stuff that I was writing and the kind of stuff that I was coming up with uh, before, and I'm like, a lot of that stuff was not that great. It was okay, but not that great, and it was it wasn't the kind of um, it, it wasn't helpful to people. So, um, but and, and I don't say this to to blow you up or flatter right. you or anything, but compared to the amount of time that you had as a Christian. Right. There's no doubt that God was revealing things to you that were way beyond sure. your life experience and way beyond your knowledge of the word. Sure. So, yeah. But, you know, it's like God's timing, God's method, you know, and it, it, God's timing and God's method hurts because it, it, it's not as quick and it's not it's not as easy. Not only that, but there's want. a cost involved. And there's most a people cost, don't understand yeah. that. Well, if it's God's grace, it should be free. No, 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 no. Grace is an empowerment. But there's always, look, in order to accomplish anything, you always got to walk away from something yeah. when it comes to the, the kingdom of God. So you made a point before. Um, you talked about how, based on what I had said about not realizing that that experience was pride that I had back in 1995, um, when I wasn't prepared to come back uh, to, to uh, spend two years at Bible school. And uh, you said that 
when God knows that you really don't realize it, that you are trying to walk in humility, uh, and you just happen to fall into pride, there's grace available. Yeah. But then when you intentionally know that you're walking in it and had no intention of, uh, of humbling yourself, then he becomes your enemy, like it said in James. Yeah, because you're reflecting his enemy. You're reflecting the enemy. Exactly. I think that's why it says you, you've made yourself God's adversary, because yes. you're reflecting the yeah. qualities of, yeah. of exactly. Lucifer. Exactly. And that is tragic for a person who's born again. So it made me think about that instant, incident we talked about earlier uh, in the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 4, all the way through Daniel chapter 6. I'm going to paraphrase it for the sake of time. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. And, you know, he's always dreaming about something. And, and none of his uh, wise men could figure anything out. So, again, they call Daniel. Daniel comes in and Nebuchadnezzar tells him the dream. And Daniel makes a statement, O oh, king, uh, I'm paraphrasing again, I wish that this was about your enemies and not you. And so he lets... He gives the interpretation about the dream. Obviously, the interpretation is based on revelation knowledge from the Holy Spirit. It's not based on the king, whatever symbols or he saw that in this dream. And the dream was that he saw a great tree cut down, but the stump was retained in the earth. Yeah. And an iron band was around it. That's all. That's the dream. And uh, Daniel comes and he's told the dream and he interprets it. And he warns the king that this is an opportunity for him to humble himself and that if he would recognize the God of heaven and realize that everything that he's accomplished, he's a great tree. And everything that he accomplished, if he recognizes and acknowledges that it was God, then he will be safe. However, if he does not recognize the God, he calls him the God of heaven, then you're going to find yourself, the kingdom is going to be taken from you and you're going to basically live like an animal for seven years. You, his his nails would grow like claws, yeah. his hair would grow like feathers, and he would literally eat grass like the cattle of the field. Yeah. So about a year goes by. Now, mind you, he's been given this warning, okay, which that in itself is the grace of God. Yeah. Humble yourself, humble yourself, humble yourself. But about a year later, he's walking around the walls of Babylon, and Babylon was one of the wonders of the world. Great, beautiful city. Major, you know, they said you could drive two chariots side by side yeah. on the walls, on top of the walls of, of Babylon. He's walking around the walls and he, he, he's looking around. He makes this statement. This is great Babylon. Look at what I have done, what I have built with my power. And a voice comes from heaven and says, the kingdom is, is taken from you. And that very night, wow. an insanity comes over him. Something comes over him. He loses his mind. Okay, somebody takes the government. They have like a, what do you call it? Like a coup d'etat. Someone comes and takes over the government. He's literally, literally fulfilling that dream. He's in the field. He, a year, seven years, he's wow. insane. Seven years. He's living like an animal, eating grass. He's wet because he's sleeping outside every night. Just a crazy situation he falls into because of pride. Okay, at the end of seven years, the Bible tells us that he lifted up his eyes, which is symbolic of he humbled himself. He lifted up his eyes, he acknowledged the God of heaven, and he's restored to the kingdom. Now, years later, when another another famous incident takes place, yeah, okay, which even people that don't know the Bible know what it means. The writing, the handwriting is on the wall. Okay, his son, it's either his son or his grandson, uh, comes to the throne. And he's given a party, okay? And he's given a party using the sacred vessels that were taken from the temple in Jerusalem. In other words, he's blaspheming God, yeah. okay? And this hand appears on the wall and writes this, this message, you've been weighed in the balances and found lacking. And Daniel comes to him because they, they didn't know what this message meant. Daniel interprets it. And he says this to the king. I believe his name was Belshazzar. He says to him, your grandfather, your father, at least humbled himself. You have not. Therefore, the kingdom is taken from you permanently. Wow. And that's the night that the Babylonian kingdom, the city of Babylon and the entire empire was taken over by the Persians. They literally came in one night, deposed him, took him out of the way, and they completely overtook yeah. that empire like this. You know what I was just thinking of? Because you said that uh, God was preparing your 
Bezalel, right? I know I butchered mm-hmm. the, the pronouncing of that name. That's true. Bezalel. Well, it's like on the other side of it, those Persians were on their way too. Yeah, they were. They were on their way, but they were on their way for the wrong reason. Yeah. The Bezalel was there for Moses to bring help to Moses. Yeah. It's Bezalel who God uses because he was in a an anointed craftsman. He's the one who designed all the fine work and craftsmanship for the tabernacle. Okay. The Joshua was prepared. Moses' brother Aaron was prepared yeah. to help him in administration and leadership. Okay. The Persians were coming as an instrument of destruction. Yeah. Why? Because pride, where pride comes, one of the scriptures we used a few weeks ago in that teaching on pride was when pride comes, it brings destruction. With humility comes wisdom. Huh. Okay. That king opened up the door for the Persians to be able to come. Okay. And we can apply this to our lives. This, oh this isn't gosh. just some hi- history. Not this at isn't all. just some history. And it's not a stuff. fable. It's a principle. It's a, it's it's a, a real life event. But look at God's grace. God warned this king. God warned him. This young man knew what happened to the grandfather years ago. When his time, for his time to be on the throne, completely dismisses the whole thing and makes a worse decision than even the father made. Yeah. And it was at least Nebuchadnezzar regained his kingdom, regained his sanity, and ends up becoming, he's at least acknowledging the God of heaven. Yeah. But this other character, this other king, lost the fact he was probably executed that night. Mm. And, and, so, and I thought of something when you said that, that Nebuchadnezzar lifted his, his eyes up. That has to mean that there's somebody higher than me. Oh, my gosh, yes. Because operating in pride, I have this lofty opinion of myself. I, I have this view of myself that, that I am ab- above others. Right, right. In humility, yeah. it's the reality that God is above me, right. and, I'm, and I'm humbling myself. I'm, I'm, I have a, a lowly spirit. I'm even willing to ha- see myself lower than others. It's not that you debase yourself. It's not that, no, because even that's no. self-centered. It is. It's still a form of pride. Yeah. Look, look, let's put it this way. Anytime we do anything to try to gain attention from people, it's pride. Yeah. Whether that's, I think I'm the greatest person in the world, or I've seen more of this. You know, I'm really not good at this kind of stuff. And, you know, really not. Like um, Andrew Womack uses an example one time, and I've seen it happen in church throughout these 24 years as a pastor, you know, uh, uh, a person who's going to sing or gets up and sings, and then they come off the platform and go, well, that wasn't very good. What are they saying? They're really looking for compliments. They're really looking for, you know, no, you did wonderful. You did great. And uh, if you were to, God forbid, say to that person, you know, you're right. It wasn't very good. They would be so offended because they really don't mean what they're saying. They're just looking for attention. Yeah. You know, I've seen this happen. I've seen it with young people throughout the years. You know, the boo-hoo-hoo, oh, you know, I'm so bad. I'm such a terrible person. I'm not worth anything. Uh, that person has a higher um, opinion of themselves than they should. They're just trying to masquerade it there. Yeah. See, when we walk in humility, we don't have to wear masks. That's and I'm a good not point. talking about medical masks. I'm talking yeah. about we don't have to put images on. That's a good point. We walk in humility. I'm free to be who I am. You're free to be who you are. It's not fair for you to project an image to me because now I'm building a relationship with an individual or an entity. I don't even know if they exist because it's not the real you. If I put an image on, if I'm projecting something different than what I am, it's not fair to you because now you're trying to develop a relationship with an entity. You don't even know if that person really exists. It's almost like everybody's on Facebook. You don't really know who they are. Yeah. You know. So I think uh, in a very practical sense, uh, I would like to really encourage those that are yeah. watching, those that are listening. Um, you can never go wrong by humbling yourself. You can mm-hmm. never go wrong by acknowledging your dependence yeah. on God. We can never go wrong on treating the other person better than ourselves. And again, let's, let's balance this out. It doesn't mean that we throw ourselves on the floor as a doormat, okay? That's not God's desire either, all right? Um, but it's that we allow him and allow, you know what it comes down to? It's allowing Christ to live through us. Yeah. He's never going to bring us. He's never going to project pride through us. It's always going to be balanced humility, just just being real and yeah. just acknowledging you are God and I'm not. And, you know, and although you've gifted me and you've given me talents and you've given me even anointing, I still can't do anything without him. We can't accomplish a thing without him. And even that in ourselves, if we keep that in our, in our forefront of our hearts, yeah. that'll keep us hum- yeah. in humility. I'm, I'm keep glad, us humble. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. Because I, I really think if if somebody were to have just one takeaway from this, if they were to remember one thing, it would be that, okay, keep at the forefront of our mind, of our minds, that 
I cannot accomplish anything without God. It's dependence on God. Absolutely. Why do you think that this is the theme this year? I, I think because life has become so difficult. Yeah. On one hand, it seems like people are more mentally crippled and emotionally crippled than they ever have been. But on the other hand, I've never seen so much pride manifesting in my life. Yeah. I don't know if it's if it's like a defense mechanism because it's like my life feels like it's out of control. So let me just build myself up in, in my own eyes and hopefully everybody else will see the same way. I mean, I've never seen so much pride in our society. I've never seen so much pride even just manifesting amongst Christians. I mean, even you, you look at stuff that people post on Facebook. You're like, my God, did you even read this before you before you hit before you clicked on post? Yeah. It's like, what do you Poor say? Pray. Yeah, or, or pray. Did you give it any thought? I mean, come on. Um, and even just the way people carry themselves lately. And, uh, you know, we expect it in the world, uh, but we expect to be a little bit more aware of it in yeah. church, in, in, in the body of Christ. I'm not talking about just church as far as new beginnings. I'm talking about just in, in the Christian society. Um, we need to walk in humility. But then again, think about this. Meekness is humility but with power that's in check. Hmm. Meekness is power under control. He, he's never t told us to be the, 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 uh, the doormat for the world, yeah. but we ought to handle ourselves with meekness. Yeah. And meekness is, you know, uh, I have the authority through the Lord Jesus Christ to pray for someone to be healed, to command yeah. healing. But if I'm doing that, from the standpoint of pride, like I'm the man, you know, just because maybe last week or this past week or two days ago, I prayed for somebody and they got healed. So now I'm going to come to you. You come to me, come to me and I'll pray for you because then I'm the guy with the power. Yeah. That person better go make their funeral arrangements. And, and the, the mercy of God, and I know we got to wrap up in a minute, but the mercy of God that, that he'll still work through that. But, it, but it, like it says, he's not going to forsake the person. He's not going to forsake the person. And it says in the scripture, but God gives more grace, more grace. He gives more grace than the world does. Right. That's for sure. Absolutely. But, so, when, but when I come, when I come to to when I approach praying someone with the attitude of meekness, like, yes, I do have the power, but it's not because of me. I have the power within yeah. me. I have the authority within me because it's been delegated to me from the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. I have to take credit for something that's being exactly. delegated to you. Exactly. But uh, you see it all the time. You see it all the time. Yeah. So, so why don't you wrap this up? Yeah. Yeah. So if, if you've been watching or, or listening and if you really uh, feel like, like the Lord has been speaking to you, um, we're, we're, we're believing that God is going to use this time, this last hour or so that we've been sharing on this stuff to uh, really start planting some seeds in your heart and so that you can bring what might be going on in your life to the Lord and so that he can begin that process of restoration, that, that process of, of humbling. And the humbling is our job. Um, but, it, but if you respond to that and if you do submit yourself, um, you won't regret it. And it might hurt at first. You know, humbling ourselves may make it's may uncomfortable. Hurt at first. It's it uncomfortable, uncomfortable at first, um, but it's worth it. I could speak from experience. I could speak from the Word of God that um, He does lift us up. He does exalt us when we humble ourselves, and we don't even realize it when He's doing it. We That's don't even the best realize part. it until late, later on when we look back. Right? It's worth it. Yeah, it's worth it's it. It's worth it. That's our message. Today. It's worth it. It's worth it for you to humble yourself. Amen. Amen. So thank you so much for tuning in, and uh, we pray that this bless you. And uh, have a good one. We'll see you next time. Amen. Bye.